Hello everyone and welcome back to Towergate. It is Towergate day number 972, 972, Saturday, November 30th, 2019. Thank you so much for tuning in. Okay, so um, then today's video, uh, something a little different. Um, uh, so I've mentioned uh, quite a few times in the past couple weeks about that really fantastic article that was written about uh, John Durham, his bio and his history, and it's a very in-depth article takes a little while to read it. It's pretty long, but it was a great article and it was picked up by many different people and uh, reposted on the Washington Examiner, uh, Daily Caller, I think, headed up, The Hill. Quite a few major publications had, had um, put the article up and I have talked about it from time to time. And I've had a couple people in the comments section ask me for links, uh, you know, or, you know, the source and all this kind of stuff. So I thought, uh, kind of a, a little bit of a slow news day. I had a little bit of time. So I went back and read the article, took some good notes, and so I'm going to kind of go through this and uh, give you some of the high points of the article. So it's really a, a really nice deep dive on uh, John Durham. And it's important because really John Durham is really he and Attorney General Barr and the president are, are really the only thing that stands between us and the devil. And uh, so a lot is riding on Mr. Durham, and a lot of us are curious, you know, what's he going to do? Is he going to turn out to be deep state and a cover-up artist? Uh, is he actually going to, uh, uh, you know, bring the criminals to justice? It's a major issue, obviously, here on Spygate. We've already unraveled the crime. We unraveled the crime here on Spygate two, you know, two years ago. Okay, so it's been uh, the last two years just trying to find out what we're going to do about it. And we finally got a good attorney general. And I think that that speech that uh, Attorney General Barr gave about two weeks ago uh, opened up a lot of eyes and perked up a lot of ears. And certainly we got a lot more confidence in Attorney General Barr after hearing the speech he gave. And so uh, I wanted to follow up with that by going back and taking some of the highlights of this article. Uh, the story was written about the career of John Durham and uh, going through that so that uh, we all really understand who it is that we're all counting on and whether or not we can count on him to do the right thing, which is to bring the criminals to justice. Um, also, I'm making a lot of progress uh, in, the, my, in the Lee Smith book. I'm now up on chapter 16. Uh, the last time I commented on the book uh, with you all would have been uh, at the end of chapter 8. Now, there's 9 through 15, chapters 9 through 15, cover a lot of material that we've already covered on Towergate. It's in my timeline. Nothing particularly new. There are a few things uh, that I'll mention that are new information, and so I'm going to hit just a couple of those things. Uh, hopefully, uh, if I have time, and I believe I will have time, because it's the second thing I'm going to talk about. And then finally, there is some news headlines of the day. Nothing too epic, but just a couple things uh, to talk about. Um, if I have some time at the end of the video. So let's go ahead and dig into <clears throat> uh, John Durham. I think many of you will appreciate this. Uh, and uh, I know when I read it, I felt much better after reading the article. So here we go. John Henry Durham. He is the U.S. Attorney for the District of Connecticut. He was appointed by Trump in February of 2018. Durham is a Republican. Durham was appointed by Attorney General Barr in May of 2019 to oversee the origins of the Russia investigation and to determine if intelligence collection involving the Trump campaign was legal and appropriate. And on October the 24th of 2019, the, um, the investigation became a criminal investigation. John Durham has a BA uh, degree from Colgate University from 1972. He has an honors degree. He got his JD from Connecticut School of Law. After graduation, he was a VISTA volunteer working on a Crow Indian reservation in Montana. Following that, Durham became a state prosecutor, then later a deputy assistant state's attorney for a period of about 35 years. In 1999, Janet Reno appointed Durham to investigate the Whitey Bulger case. Durham secured the conviction of a retired FBI agent, John Connolly, who got 10 years in federal prison on racketeering charges for protecting Bulger and his accomplices. Charges were also filed on FBI agent Paul Rico 
on murder charges. Rico died in 2004 before the case could go to trial. In 2005, uh, Durham was appointed to investigate the CIA's destruction of videotapes of detainee interrogations. Uh, Durham did not uh, recommend filing criminal charges and the case is sealed. In November of 2011, Durham was included in the New Republic's list of Washington's most powerful, least famous people. That was in 2011. <clears throat> <clears throat> John Durham has been described as being careful, thoughtful, and methodical. He's known for his modesty and his restraint, and he runs away from cameras, and he doesn't tolerate any leaks. Durham is a fierce but fair prosecutor. He is thorough and nonpartisan. A former U.S. attorney who knows Durham well says that Durham is not naive. He understands the political implications of the work he's been asked to do by Attorney General Barr, and he understands the political impact that it could have. He's not going to wilt under that weight, according to this uh, U.S. attorney who knows him quite well. Durham has faced off against the CIA, the FBI, the mob, specifically the Genovese crime family, Dur Durham, uh, rat racked up convictions in high-profile organized crime cases, which earned him the nickname The Bull. Then he went to work on the Bonanno crime family, where he got con convictions on all the top family players, which led to Durham also nailing some crooked teamsters for embezzling money from union health care plans. Durham took down the leader of the KKK in southern New England. Next, Durham sent his own state's governor, John Rowland to prison. Despite the fact that both Rowland and Durham were, were Republicans, Durham got Rowland on bribery charges, and he also got Rowland's deputy chief of staff for bribery as well. Durham is not a man who is motivated or influenced by a political agenda. If witnesses do not cooperate during trials, Durham will bring them back till they do. He'll bring them back, has been known to bring people back four, five, and even six times. He'll do whatever it takes until they cooperate. One of Durham's sons is a prosecutor who is currently prosecuting MS-13 gang members. General Mike Mukasey, former Attorney General Mike Mukasey, who appointed Durham to a high-profile case and who knows Durham well, says Durham is by the book, he is thorough and fair, and will get to the bottom of things. Durham will not speak to the press until he's done, and probably not even then. Until then, he will be in constant pursuit of the truth and the facts and the evidence. He does not take days off. John Durham's career is full of big, high-stakes, politically charged cases. But this one is the biggest, highest stakes, and most politically charged of all cases he has ever tried. If Durham chooses to bring charges against any official who launched the Trump probe, history suggests that he is confident he can persuade a jury to convict and then sustain the conviction upon appeal. If he does not bring charges, it is extremely unlikely that any other prosecutor could have succeeded securing the conviction. So in other words, what they say about Durham is he doesn't like going through an entire, he will not go through this entire process with a case unless he believes he can actually win the case. And he doesn't just look at the initial case because he knows there's always an appeal. He will not go to court with his evidence and take someone to court and try to try them unless he believes he could not only win the legal case in court, the criminal case, but also sustain that through the appeal. He wants to be able to know that he for sure can win the case and win the appeal, or he likely will not bring the charges. Okay. Now, <clears throat> as I mentioned, so anyway, there you go. That's, the, that's just some of the major 
pieces of information out of the John Durham that gives you a really good idea of the type of person we're dealing with, which obviously he's a hard-nosed prosecutor. He doesn't allow politics to get involved in anything. He does not talk to the press. He doesn't do write books. He doesn't write op-eds. He doesn't do interviews. He doesn't do... He just, he's, he, he does not uh, like to be public in any way, shape, or form. And it's very likely, based on what we're, we learned from this article, that even after, uh, let's say he brings charges against the uh, criminal conspirators, it's likely he will not even have a press conference to tell you about it. He's just going to take these people to court. He's going to try the cases against them, follow through the appeal process, and beat them there as well. And it'll be up to someone else to go out and talk to the press or do press conferences. He doesn't like doing them. Uh, he doesn't like the spotlight or any of that type of thing. He just likes to get convictions of guilty people. And he especially doesn't like, probably, now people say who know him pretty well, that if you actually know him really well uh, and he feels pretty comfortable with you, he's actually pretty funny, uh, you know, and has a pretty good sense of humor. But most people are very intimidated by him because uh, if you don't know him, you've never been around him before, especially in court. He's very intimidating, a uh, very serious character. Um, but uh, he's, he, he seems to be the type of person who you are not going to scare him. He's not afraid. This is what the one U.S. attorney that were asking him, you know, this is a big profile case. You know, you're going after some very high level people. This could go all the way up to the president of the United States himself, Barack Hussein Obama. You know, knowing that, is that a situation where he would feel he has to pull back because of the political ramifications and other things? And... Uh, you know, this U.S. attorney who knows him says, no, that's not Durham. Believe me, Durham doesn't care if you're the president. He took down his own state's governor, and he was a Republican. No, he doesn't care. He blinds all that stuff out. As far as he's concerned, he's looking at facts, he's looking at crimes, and he's looking at criminals. And he don't give a damn if you're the top 1% or the poorest guy on the planet. He doesn't care. He doesn't include any of that. He's strictly by the facts, by the book, by the law, and uh, let the chips fall where they may. Now, this probably uh, has a lot to do with why Barr appointed him. And uh, the only thing that's really not in the article that I was really hoping would be in the article, or hoping to learn because none of us still really know this uh, at this point, is where is he going to bring those charges? Is he going to bring those charges in Washington, D.C. or in Connecticut or somewhere else? Remember, they got Huber, John Huber, out there in, uh, what, Utah? Maybe they could bring the charges out in Utah. So I think if they try to take down these deep state critters in, in the District of, uh, of Criminals, where it's 96% or something registered Democrats, or they love Obama and hate Trump, uh, I'd say you have a hard time getting convictions on e no matter how much evidence you have uh, against these people. But of course, if you can go to someplace like Connecticut or, or Utah or maybe someplace else, maybe Virginia, something like that, uh, maybe you'll stand a better chance of getting these people convicted. It's not in the article where these charges may come from, but it was in the article that some of the work that's being done, that's being subcontracted out by Durham, is being subcontracted out to uh, Huber out in Utah, particularly the stuff regarding uh, the stuff he's been working on with Horowitz, the FISA and all that stuff, uh, because a lot of the information they need is out there where Huber is. Uh, he's out there where the NSA's records division is, where all the documents are, are stored. And uh, he's known as being a fairly, you know, uh, unbiased, fairly good prosecutor. He's very also doesn't talk much, pretty quiet. We know that Barr had a meeting with him a while back. And uh, we know that the recent uh, criminal referral, though, went from Horowitz to Huber. But a lot of the investigative work, a lot of the document research and things came from Huber. So I'm not sure, you know, if he could bring these cases in Utah, or if he has to bring these cases in D.C., or if he has an option. Obviously, he'd like to see him do it in Connecticut. Um, some of his investigators are from Connecticut. Another thing that they mentioned in the story was every time that he's been appointed as a special U.S. attorney or special counsel to investigate these high-profile crimes, he likes to bring in agents from various places who do not know each other because he doesn't like cliques. So he don't want to bring in and use all the people from one agency or one department or one place because those people all work together every day. They all have a click. There could be little things going on. He doesn't want that. What he does is he grabs a couple people from here, a couple people from here, a couple people here, a couple people here, brings them all together. They don't know each other for the most part. 
uh, or they don't work together every day. They come from different offices. So he pulls together a wide range of people from different places because he doesn't like cliques. He doesn't want people getting these little cliques and forming their own little group think. He likes to avoid any of that type of thing. And he apparently is um, uh, pretty hard driving and uh, he drives the investigation. He's telling people what I, he's, I want you to investigate this. I want you to get this, get this, get this, get this. So he, he, he is not like a, a Uncle Bob the executioner who just sees this as a, like Uncle Bob. We could tell from the hearings that he was appointed the special counsel, but it's obvious that he had very, very little input in what was going on because in the hearings, he didn't even know who Fusion GPS was. Didn't know who Glenn Simpson was. <laughs> he didn't seem to know much about anything. So this is not Durham. Durham is a hardcore micromanager. He doesn't just go sit in an office or go play golf or work on 10 other things and bring in a bunch of people to do the work. He personally oversees every single detail of the investigation. Of course, we've learned over the course of the summer, he's been traveling all over Europe uh, and some sometimes he's with Barr uh, doing that because he, he actively gets involved in the case himself. So I think what I take away from Durham is he is a lot like Attorney General Barr and I think that's why Barr appointed him because I think Barr realized he had to get someone outside of the District of Criminals. He had to get someone who at least has a reputation that number one, they're not afraid to go after the deep state and certainly uh, Durham isn't. He's gone after them before. He's put plenty of FBI agents, uh, CIA people, uh, he's investigated them, took down his own state's governor. He's, he's taken down two crime families, hundreds uh, of people, and organized crime. So he's you can't intimidate him. You can't scare him. Uh, you can't uh, do any of this stuff. And uh, he's he's not a biased, politi politically biased person. He's a Republican, but you know he'll put Republicans in jail just as fast as he will a Democrat. And um, he has a deep, intense uh, like bar, and I think this is where they have a like mind. Both Barr and Durham have a very, very deep respect for the Constitution, the rule of law, and uh, equal justice under the law. This is something that both of them seem to be really hung up on, this sort of idea that everybody should face uh, equal justice. So I, I, I think this all bodes well, and that the only, the only thing is, we have to keep in mind that we learned another thing about him, is that Durham doesn't take cases to trial unless he believes that they can sustain the uh, appeal process and that can be the thing that will get him sometimes to say well we'll win the case but it'll go to court to appeal and we'll lose on appeal you know boom let's get some more evidence let's tie up whatever we can if we can't close that loop it goes in the shit can so that's the only thing that uh, would give me some reserve but for the most part uh, I feel really good about Durham and Barr and as I've said many times before, I don't think they have a whole lot of choice, to be quite honest with you, because uh, the top guy uh, on the totem pole is the President of the United States, and he's the one who's clearly made it, uh, I'm sure, very clear to Attorney General Barr that he wants this thing sniffed out, he wants it worked out, and he wants the people held accountable who uh, tried to uh, destroy him. And I think Barr feels the same. You can tell from the speech that he made a couple of weeks ago that he's pretty much in the same place Trump is on that. And uh, the fact that he appointed Durham uh, tells us, and what we learned from Durham, that all three of these guys, Trump, Barr, and, and Durham, all three guys who uh, definitely are not afraid of the deep state, not, afa not afraid to take them on, and ultimately will not allow a political decision to color their judgment when it comes time to um, uh, hold people accountable for the crimes that they committed. So I feel pretty good about all that. Now, having said that, I need to run and grab my Lee Smith book really quick, and we'll hit some of these things, uh, new information from Lee Smith in the last several chapters that I've uh, covered. Be right back. Okay, so the last time we talked about Lee Smith's book uh, was chapter 8, and that was Obama's dossier. And, uh, of course, that was the ICA, uh, the uh, Intelligence Community Assessment, which served as uh, the thing that allowed them to move towards the coup. And uh, after the dossier had failed uh, to stop Trump, the ICA became the thing that they used to uh, move forward uh, to proceed with uh, taking Trump out to destroy him. 
uh, one way or another. Now, <clears throat> chapters uh, 9, 10, 11, 12, 13, 14, 15, uh, and 16 are the chapters I've covered since the last time I talked to you. And a lot of that is stuff, it's not that it's not important, it's not important information or good information, it's just that it's stuff that we have covered pretty thoroughly on Towergate, it's all in my timeline. Nothing particularly new, just a lot of background information, very good information, and a lot of focus in a couple of them chapters is on Nunez and his investigative team. Uh, and uh, because Lee Smith, in writing the book, spent a lot of time, a lot of hours interviewing with Nunez and his lead investigator. That's where a lot of this information comes from, is from his lead investigator. But there's some new information or some things that we suspected which we did not know for sure, but now can be confirmed because of evidence provided to Lee Smith by uh, this um, investigator for Devin Nunez. So I made a note here of just a few things that um, we might want to take a look at. Let me find, uh, let's see, chapter 9. Let's go to chapter 9. And chapter 9 is called The Press Breaks. And chapter 9 really focuses a lot on how Lee Smith believes that the media really, that was the breaking point. In his mind, uh, the way that the press was brought in to participate in the coup, to be an active member of the coup, working on behalf of the Hillary Clinton campaign, uh, knowing good and well that they were participating in this circular media strategy being run by McCabe and Strzok and Page, whereby they would leak information to the media, the media would write the story, and then Strzok and Page, McCabe, would then use the story that the media wrote based on the evidence they leaked to allow them to move to an another phase of their investigation, to investigate farther. It's what they used to justify looking deeper into Michael Flynn. So this was sort of the media strategy they used. Leak information to the press, let the press write the story, then they would use the story uh, to, the same thing happened of course with the uh, Steele dossier and, and the uh, FISA warrant on Carter Page. Uh, they say the Steele dossier and, and the story by Michael Isikoff was the, the two things mainly that they used to get the warrant. Well, of course, they knew that Michael Isikoff, uh, that his source was essentially the same. It was Christopher Steele. So it was the same source, but they just kind of subcontracted out Michael Isikoff. And, of course, they knew that Michael Isikoff's source was Steele. And they knew it was the same information coming from the same place. They just plugged in. Uh, is a cop. And this was done over and over and over again using all these major uh, newspapers and, and online uh, news sites. Uh, it, was, it was an entire strategy. It was part of the overall plot. And so Lee Smith really focuses chapter 9 is about how the media willingly uh, involved themselves in this plot by partaking in this media strategy. So it's a very good chapter. Uh, it's a long chapter. But it's, uh, it's, it's quite good. Uh, so let's go to page 139 uh, in the chapter, chapter 10 of Blood in the Water. So again, we're talking about David Ignatius. Now, uh, I suspected, and I believe uh, this is in my timeline, I think we talked about it well over a year ago, that we had learned that David Ignatius, this reporter, um, was essentially being paid by the Hillary Clinton campaign. Uh, he was working with Alexandra Chalupa, and uh, she was using him uh, as a way to filter information that she was getting from Ukraine to Ignatius, and he was feeding it back to the DNC, the Clinton campaign, essentially. And I'm pretty certain that he was being paid. He was essentially a reporter who was brought into the Clinton campaign uh, to write hit pieces uh, on Trump and especially pieces that would be that were supposed to be part of the October surprise uh, which didn't actually materialize. So uh, they point out that Lee Smith points out in the book that Ignatius is an intelligence community insider and his column is traditionally a platform for both information and disinformation. 
uh, that's leaked by U.S. government agencies as well as foreign intelligence services. And we learn here that he was in London in early March and offered to come up to Cambridge to meet um, uh, Svetlana Lakova. Svetlana Lakova being the woman who Halper uh, claimed was having some sort of a, 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 a affair or something with Michael Flynn. And of course, Halper's trying to tie her uh, to Russia as some sort of a Russian asset. And that, that whole phony story that Halper put together was used to go after Michael Flynn. And of course, Halper knew none of this was true. So Ignatius wanted to go to London and talk to Lakova. So Ignatius uh, goes over to London and uh, he's there in early March and he calls Lakova and he was wanting to talk, <clears throat> excuse me, <clears throat> he was wanting to talk to Lakova about the Flynn, Michael Flynn, and about the 2014 dinner where they were at that dinner for RT. And um, Lakova says that she, she tells Lee Smith that uh, she told him, told Ignatius, not to bother getting together with her because the story about her and Michael Flynn was nonsense. Nothing to talk about. The story was nonsense. At which point, Ignatius said that he was surprised because he'd always found Stefan Halper to be a very reliable source. <laughs> so here we have Stefan Halper. <clears throat> we have David Ignatius telling us that Halper has always been a reliable source. Now, Ignatius is working as a surrogate for the Clinton campaign. He's also one of the people that they're flowing uh, propaganda to, anti-Trump, Trump and anti-Trump Russia, anti-Trump stuff, uh, stuff on Paul Manafort, stuff on Michael Flynn. Ignatius is a, is, is a key uh, journalist uh, who they're using to flood all this propaganda out there. And we know that when Christopher Steele told Kathleen Kavalik about how this uh, so-called Russian was one of his sources, as it turns out, this particular Russian that was supposedly one of Steele's sources is actually a very close confidant, a person who Halper associates with quite often. And that story made its way to Ignatius. So it looks an awful lot like Halper was a lot more involved than we thought. That Halper might have been feeding Steele, who was feeding Ignatius, or possibly he was feeding Ignatius, who was feeding Steele. Halper comes into the mix between Steele and Ignatius. We learn it right here, and it's the first time that we've seen that. That is new. Now, let's move ahead to page 205. And the title of this chapter, chapter 15, is Dirty Cops. You can imagine what that's about. <clears throat> so, I've highlighted something here. I'm just going to read it to you. The most important thing to know about the special counsel investigation is that by the time Mueller came on, the FBI had been monitoring Trump communications for several months. Since October 21st, it had been looking for just one email or phone call and had come up with nothing. Mueller could have wrapped up the collusion investigation on May 18th. Instead, the anti-Trump operation marched on with the same people and even more power and resources. McCabe was now the acting director of the FBI. Christopher Steele was still around too. Right after Comey had been fired, McCabe had reached out to him through Bruce Orr. So he's saying that Bruce Orr had reached out to Christopher Steele through Bruce Orr. And of course, we know that to be true from other reporting that essentially McCabe went to Orr and said, yeah, man, we had to fire Steele because he got caught leaking to the press, but we still want to keep talking to him. So why don't you keep your back channel open with him? And then we're going to assign an FBI agent to you who can debrief you every time you talk to Steele. <clears throat> Mueller knew all this was going on. The new funding source for the external operation was the Democracy Integrity Project, DIP, run by former Diane Feinstein aide Daniel Jones. DIP 
paid Fusion GPS, which Jones called a shadow media organization, at least $3.3 million to continue its work, while Steel received $250,000. Another Fusion GPS contractor for the Trump-Russia project, Edward Baumgartner, was paid $125,000. This all happened after Mueller was appointed, and he knew every bit of it. Okay, let's go to the next. Now, we're now into chapter 16, which is, this book is kind of divided into two parts. The first part of the book is uh, about the coup and how it all went down and the origins of it. The second part is called Investigating the Investigators. And so the second half of the book is where it all kind of turns and... Uh, people now start looking at the, at the plot, investigating the plot. So that's kind of where we are now. <clears throat> so there's a key thing right here in this chapter where Smith writes, both Steele and Bruce Orr were on Fusion GPS's payroll. Formally, they were paying his wife, Nellie, says Patel. But by extension, they were paying the number four guy at the DOJ. Very interesting take by Lee Smith here, because I haven't heard that quite before, but it's quite logical. We always think about, well, they brought in Nelly, because she's this open source researcher, speaks Russian, reads Russian. She can look at all this open source stuff in Russian language, and Russian newspapers, and Russian documents. But Lee Smith points out that really, Nelly Orr, that kind of stuff, yeah, they could have got that from Baumgartner, they could have got that from a million people who are... Russian-speaking people who can read German or read Russian papers, read Russian documents, and get all of that. That the key reason, though, that Lee Smith believes that Nellie Orr was tapped was because she was married to Bruce Orr, number four man at the DOJ, who they could use to pipeline things internally without having to create too much uh, uh, unsightly uh, or uh, instances or anything that might throw up a red flag. Bruce Orr could operate pretty much under the wire because. People were used to seeing him in and around the FBI building. <clears throat> Not unusual to see him there. Whereas it would have been unusual to see some person who didn't really belong. <clears throat> we have another thing here where the 12 302s that were documenting Bruce Orr's meetings with the FBI start on November 22nd of 2016. They memorialize all of Orr's interactions with Simpson and Steele which began in January of 2016 at the latest. That's new information. That, that Steele was working with or speaking with Bruce Orr about Trump Russia, about this stuff, at least no later, no later than January of 2016. Wow. It's pretty amazing. Now, we're just about out of time. But I did want to mention this other thing. Two things. Number one, we learned yesterday that it wasn't Inspector General Huckleberry Horowitz, nor was it the FBI or any other government agency, not their hard investigative work or their you know brilliance, which allowed them to discover the Strzok page texts. In fact, the thing that brought the page Strzok text to light was literally Peter Benstrokinus, his wife, got hold of her husband's phone and saw all the stuff going on between he and Lisa Page. First, she called Lisa Page and called her out. Then she went directly to the FBI <laughs> and pointed out the conflict going on here. And so it was Strzok's wife that brought all this to light. Not the IG, not Mueller, not anyone in the FBI or DOJ. It was Strzok's wife that blew the whistle and blew all that wide open. We also learned that this Inspector General of the Intelligence Community, who I've been telling you for weeks now is crooked as hell, Michael Atkinson, was Sally Moyer and Kevin Kleinsmith's boss at the DOJ NSD. Of course, they were having an extramarital affair at the time. Atkinson was Chief Legal Counsel at the DOJ NSD. He altered the form for Sharamella, which allowed that fake whistleblower to uh, produce hearsay evidence and start the whole uh, 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 
thing that we have going on now. And of course, now we're learning that Atkinson's wife, Catherine, was nominated for a GIR award by Mary Jacoby, who is the wife of Glenn Simpson. 